Um, I am a modern work customer success manager at Microsoft. Uh, and I've put some little bits and bobs there. So I've got my Twitter uh, handle there if you want to do that. If you want to contact me on LinkedIn, um, I've highlighted the M in yellow because unfortunately somebody got there before me uh, with the just straight normal Stuart readout. So you've got to go Stuart M readout, unfortunately. Um, and also I've put the link there to my YouTube channel uh, as the productivity coach. So today um, I want to talk to you about how you can use Teams and really Microsoft 365 as a wider entity to build an innovation and collaboration culture in your organization. I am super passionate about this and I'm so pleased that Raz has given me this four hour slot where I'm just going to talk to you continuously about for four hours about the different ways that we can go there. Um, so please don't worry, it's, it's not four hours. Like, oh my God, what have I signed up for? Um, so I'd love to know what kind of job roles people have so we kind of understand a little bit more about the audience that we've got today. So if you could pop in the chat, I want to see the chat go mad today. Um, come on, we've had our lunch, we need to wake up. So I'd love to just see some comments in the chat there about what your role is, um, where, where you're, you know, what kind of organisation you're in, anything, anything that will help me to make sure that this uh, this presentation is really tailored for you. So I'm going to be talking um, about some of my ideas um, <clears throat> and some of my, my framework for how you can kind of build innovation within your organization. I have some demos of little bits and bobs. It's not super technical, um, but it is there to kind of try and excite people about what the possibility is um, and, and really kind of help them with that. So I'm going to go for about 45 minutes, have time for questions. Again, please pop some questions in um, the chat there as well. Great. Let's crack on. So obviously it's, you know, we, we can't avoid the fact the world has, the way that we work has changed forever. The world has changed forever. Um, I, I still kind of look back to when kind of COVID started and I was like, does it, is, was it only, was it only March 2020? It feels like it was, feels like it was, two years previously to that. Um, <clears throat> but obviously the pandemic's pushed all of us to kind of transform and approach work differently. Um, and it, at Microsoft, we were talking about it way back then. We were talking about this, this three level process about talking about uh, respond. So, you know, what were we doing immediately as soon as that the pandemic came? Then how do we kind of plan our recovery? And then how do we reimagine? How do we take the learnings from that? Um, and, you know, I think for lots of organisations, they're coming out of recover now and they're actually in that reimagine phase. Um, and, you know, how, what does that new normal look like? How are we going to reimagine how work is going forward? Now, that could be, you know, how well, about our location, about hybrid work considerations, all of those kind of things. But it can also be like, how do we collaborate? How do we work across those hybrid boundaries, um, et cetera, and work together? And we still know that digital transformation is number one on the CIO priority list. We've got loads of stats and things that, uh, that back this up. Um, and we know that this is so 85% of companies accelerated digitization of employee interaction and collaboration and 67% uh, accelerated automation and AI with workflows. So really big goals there for CIOs, CTOs, that kind of audience. Um, around the world. So the question is like, you know, where, where are you on your journey and how are you envisioning uh, how you're how you're going to be going? And obviously for us in Microsoft, you know, Teams is where we want that to happen. We've got 250 million uh, monthly active users on Microsoft Teams. And we know for lots of organizations, the pace of digital transformation to be able to kind of get to grips with using a platform such as Teams really, you know, really accelerated for that. And we want to keep that pace going. And we know the organization, because our customers are telling us they're looking for this new workplace. They're looking beyond meetings and chat um, and, and trying to find this new workspace where we're not bound by physical spaces. Um, and they're looking to transform their processes and workflows from within Teams. So just in case you don't know what Teams is, uh, so Teams is the place, is the hub for teamwork we talk about where we can stay connected. So we're talking about the meetings, the chats, 
things like this, where we can collaborate seamlessly. So bringing those documents together, bringing channel chats together, uh, kind of bringing apps in. And then really the sweet spot for us and something that I'm really kind of starting to lean in on with my customers this year is around integrating business processes. So not just having Teams as our Skype for business replacement or where we just have meetings or where I can chat to my buddy, but actually where is this, you know, how is this integrated into our, um, our actual business processes? Because we're in a really unique position right now. We're never going to have this opportunity again to create change that benefits everyone. And the important part here for me is the bit that says, and leave no one behind. Because we're talking here about information workers, but we're also talking about first line workers, because quite often we know that there's a whole load of innovation that happens for people who are information workers, but first line workers, frontline workers sometimes get a little bit left behind on their tooling or they might not be encouraged in the right way to kind of go forward and innovate. So my big push this year uh, for, for me is around innovation for everyone. And to facilitate that, I kind of split up the opportunities for innovation into these three buckets. So we've got native apps, so things like innovation with lists and SharePoint and forms and approvals, things like this. And really, this falls into this bucket of DIY, DIY innovation. This is something that you could just spin up yourself. Anybody could spin up given the right training and the right information, etc. But they can do that and optimize their processes uh, and innovate and change the way that they work on this on this micro or macro level. OK, and actually, as an organization, all of those efficiencies build up together. I sometimes think that we as Microsoft and customers, when we when we talk to when we're thinking about innovations, they're thinking about massive, big, transformative innovations. And we absolutely have to keep our eye on those innovations and move forward on that. But we have also got to be able to come down to the, the individual level to say, actually, you're working on a process that involves three people, but it's really important to you. I know that this is a process that you spend 20 hours a week on. So I want to be able to make sure that you're able to innovate around that process because I'm not going to spend £20,000 to go and get somebody to build you a system. But I absolutely support you to be able to uh, make some innovations that make your life easier. And I want to show you how to do that. So that's really where we fall in with that native apps. Then we move up to low code and no code platforms. So we're talking here about power apps, power BI, power virtual agents. And again, that's taking us up just a just a level. So uh, yes, it is low code. Uh, the more sophisticated you want to be, the more code that there, there does come into that. Um, and we do really need to recognize that. Um, and for lots of organizations, this brings their own thought process around how do we govern this and, and, and where is that data going and all of those kind of things. So, it, so there's definitely a step up from kind of just native app built into the product app thing to then being able to say, actually, how can we leverage the low code platform? There's a huge opportunity for uh, customers to be able to build their own apps using Power Apps and uh, Power Virtual Agents for bots, etc. But there is a, a level up of complexity. Um, and then lastly is there is pro devs. So how do you work with your developer audience if you've got developers within your organization to say, actually, how can you hook into Teams? We know that we've got this line of business app that, you, that you've been working on for quite some time, but actually it's still sending when it needs somebody's uh, approval for something or it needs to inform somebody that something's fallen over somewhere, it still sends them an email and that falls down the mailbox, etc. You know, how can we leverage those extensibility points within Teams? So I'm going to look at all three of those pillars today, um, especially towards the end. It's not going to be a how to, but it is really kind of an idea to say, oh, actually giving you the idea about where those extensibility points exist into Teams. So you can go back and have those conversations with developers and say, hmm, well, you know, I've seen I've seen this uh, this guy talking about this. I'd like to see how we can use that in our system. So let's start then and we'll look <coughs> at native apps. What I should have said, apologies, is down the bottom is this orchestration layer. So Teams is the orchestration layer where everything comes in together 
and actually Power Automate does a lot of the, the heavy lifting for us um, in lots of these kind of native and the low code scenarios. So lots of love there uh, for Power Automate as well. So I'm gonna talk about native apps and I'm going to look at it from the context of project management. So we know that that is something that most organizations are very familiar with and they have that capability within their organization. And a lot of the time when I'm talking to my customers about how we can innovate, um, I talk to them about a crawl, walk, run approach. So let's not try to get to the absolute super duper mega automated AI infused wonderfulness yet. Let's kind of start at this crawl stage. Let's let's get some incremental gains, because if we can build an MVP, a minimum viable product now, then we can build upon it. And actually, you could start to be getting value from that right now. So I've just picked out three examples here. One is around kind of risks and issues within uh, within a project management context. One's around kind of collaboration around documents and approvals. And then lastly, the last one is around uh, feedback and how we can use forms for that. So let's talk firstly around like, risks and issue management and things like this. So lists is a great product built into teams part built into sharepoint as well <coughs> excuse me um, and it's really really powerful but we know especially in the project management world people love a spreadsheet but if we can get that data to come out of the spreadsheet and go into a list we know that there's so much more power that comes from it whether that is that we can automate when things happen on a row by row basis that we can do some great formatting, that we can link that list into awesome BI dashboards that allow us to, uh, to do wonderful things, that we've got item level histories and things like this. A list is a massive, massively uh, important thing there. So let's just take a look here, because I've said here that on the crawl um, one here, we're talking about templated lists. So if, you're, uh, if your end users don't know, they can just go into any of these teams here. And I'm into the, I'm in my NC640 sales channel. And if they hit the plus up here, there we go. And they can go onto lists here. And I'm just going to click save when that's done. There are some really great templates that can get them started. So lots of people, we see them, they go straight here onto this creator list here. So here it is. They go, oh, I need to do this. And actually, you know, they don't look about whether there's other lists that people have got, etc. But when they go into that create a list, super templates. So if we were talking about issues, then I would probably say the best one there is to look at an issue tracker. So we can do this. It gives us a little preview about what that looks like. And I can see there um, I've got the issue itself. I've got the description. I've got some really nice nicely formatted priorities and statuses, etc. Uh, and if I scroll along here, I can link out to other things um, and I've got some calculations and things like this. So actually, I can just click use template there. Click create. And bam, in just a few seconds, you can actually have your cut your end users, uh, people within your business to be able to track that through there. And that is a, that's just a, a typical crawl approach there that we could just say to people, instead of going into the spreadsheet, let's put in uh, in here. So let's say that the issue is that the security pass system, oops, is no longer working. Da, 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 da. There we go. And we can say that this is high priority. Um, and we can see we've got these different uh, status is here. Uh, we can enter like the different things like links off to other other um, systems and things like this. If we had photos and people could be doing this on their phone as well. This just enables them to be able to do this straight from within Teams. Um, and then they can click save there. Now, one of the great things is that that's all that's all there easily, easily accessible. But as we move up that process, as we move into that walk and that run process, we can then start to put automation around that. So absolutely, first stage really is looking at these templated lists, 
just look, see what's there. How can you make use of that within your organization? Then when you've got a bit more understanding about it, then you can start to look at creating your own lists from scratch. OK, so let's say that I had, uh, let's say that I'm still in my project management context. So I'm going to go to lists again and I'm going to click save. There we go. And I'm going to create a new one, but this time I'm going to do it from scratch. So I'm going to do it from this blank one. And this is actually going to be my project log. There it is there. So I've got my project title there. I might have my start date. OK, I might have my project status. So let's say that's going to be a choice. OK, and this can be on track. Locked. Oh, no. Oops. There we go. At risk. Or it could be blocked here. It's really easy then to format that to say, well, actually, on track's green, at risk is yellow, and blocked I'm going to have as red. And they can build up all of these cons here and do lots of clever stuff <clears throat> and start to build those in. So they could say that this is the, uh, okay, uh, let's say this is the Teams phone deployment. There we go then, and we're going to say that that's on track. So again, once they've got a little bit more understanding of it, they can then start to build their own lists up around that. And I, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I know that everybody's desperate to get to the run part because this is where lists come in, into its own and becomes really, really cool because then you can start to leverage Power Automate to say, well, actually, in my project log, if this gets changed to blocked, if a project manager goes in and says that their project's changed to be blocked, then I need to tell people and I need to shout it from the rooftops or whatever. And that's then when Power Automate really comes into its own. So let's just pop across to that. <coughs> there we go. And again, this isn't, you know, we're not looking here to make a, um, a tutorial on Power Automate, but there are great flows and templates already in that. But I'm going to cr just create my own. And I'm going to do an automated one here because I just want to show you the possibility here. So I'm going to call this Notify Blocked. And I'm going to say when an item's created or modified in my SharePoint list. And I'm going to pick my list. Where did I put it? Is it in retail? It's in retail. There we go, my project log. So I'm going to say when an item is uh, modified, then I'm going to put this condition in and I'm going to say if the project status value is equal to blocked, then what I'm going to do is uh, post a message. I'm going to post a message in a chat or channel, and we're going to stick it into the channel. I'll say which channel. So I'm going to go into the retail team. Come on, there we go. Into the retail team and into the NC460 sales. And I'm going to say, warning. Let's make it. Let's make it bold. Let's make it big. Yeah, let's make it red. So everyone worries about it. Um, and then I can use that data that we've got there. I can say the title project has been changed to blocked. OK, and this is just a few a few clicks there that we can do this. OK, so that is now done. And then the next time it could be that somebody's created a new one or it could be that we just edit this and we change it to blocked. That will automatically now run in the background. And that will in a moment post a message through into my channel to give me a notification. Now, this is just, you know, this is just one example of the application of this. It could be, imagine if you were starting a project log here. So we stick with our project log list. As we go down, we've gone past run. Let's say we've gone on to sprint now. We could say, well, actually, if the PMO create a new entry in the project log, 
then what I want to do is automatically spin up uh, a Microsoft Teams team that has all of the right channels, has all of the right documentation and all of that kind of thing so that we've got this standardized process. And all they have to do is just type a row into their spreadsheet. So there you go. We can see that actually what's happened here is that warning message has come through um, and it's told me that the Teams phone deployment project has been changed to blocked. So we're giving people real time notifications in Teams where they're working. OK, we could be tagging different people in. And we could actually go off and make other actions from that. So one of the other great things that you could be doing with uh, lists and Power Automate, et cetera, is it might, it might link off to a planner board and say, actually, if this has been changed to blocked, I need to add an action to someone to go and find out why that is blocked. So you can see there that that crawl, walk, run kind of process has taken us from templated to this automation in just a few clicks. But if they're using that templated list, they're getting value straight away. So moving down then is collaborating on documents in Teams. Now, I really think that um, we really underestimate the collaboration in Teams. So let me just find my document that I had earlier. There we go. Um, because what we tend to see happen is let's uh, let's pop the file in. In fact, actually, I'm not going to do it that way. What tends to happen a little bit more is that we have either we create a new document in there or people will uh, people will just upload it into the channel there okay and then that gives people the opportunity to be able to go in and collaborate on that okay but what we so that's really for us that is the that is the the crawl there's still loads and loads of customers, loads and loads of organizations who are still communicating documents by email. So if it was a document review, they send that document out to 10 people. That's 10 new copies of the document. They then save it to their hard drive because they're probably not working in OneDrive, save it to their document. That's another 10 copies of the document. They then change it and email it back. That's another 10 copies of the document. And then some poor person's got to recombine all of those things there. So actually, just going on to collaboration and saying okay here's the document we can all work on this in real time together is still a massive collaboration innovation for lots and lots of departments customers and individuals and we shouldn't underestimate that but we want to make it cool so we want to go another stage on so actually it's about having this conversation here so we might say so we might say, in fact, so we might say at Stuart. Let's find me again. There you go. Um, can you check this, please? One of the great things about this is that when you're having this conversation in this conversation pane down the side, um, and we know that people don't like, don't like to use the web versions, but they are really, really great. You do also get your conversation that's happening there. So we could have people who are going back and forth. So let me change to my other persona. There we go. So I can say, looks good to me. OK, and then Eve, and then later on, you know, when we when we come down the line, you know, maybe two months down the line and we kind of go, do you know what? How did that document come about to be the way that it is? Because I'm really interested in, in the conversations that happened around that document. So when we bring that document in there and we have those conversations that, then two months down the line, when we come to this and we pick up that pricing guidelines document and we're doing that in Teams, uh, we can then pick up the conversation tab. So now this conversation, this this file's long gone. You know, we the conversation's moved on. There's been hundreds of chat messages since then. If I open that document and I go to conversation, then the conversation history that's happened around that document is still attached to that object. So it's really powerful to come back to later to say, who was the person who suggested we add that bid bid in, or or those kind of things. And I, I think there's lots of people who underestimate um, the power of that. And then the last step in that in our crawl walk run, oops, in the last step in our crawl walk run is actually saying, well, let's move to approvals. 
But again, let's let's keep it in line. So here I am here. Jack and I have been having this conversation about the document. Maybe we've collaborated. I don't need to show you collaboration. We all know that. OK, but what I can do here is I can click on reply under here and kind of go, right, I need Jack to, to sign it off now because he's the final person. So down here in these message extensions down the bottom here, there's this just this little fella here, the approvals uh, message extension. So I can click there and I can say um, approve pricing document. There it is there. And I could say that this is for Jack to approve. Now I could put multiple people in here, just keeping it simple uh, in here. Uh, and I've got require a response from all recipients. So if I had multiple, I could say, I just need one person to approve it, or I need multiple people to approve it. And um, I could put some more info in here. Um, this is at final draft, please approve, okay? Uh, and actually, I could attach it up here, but I'm not going to because I've done it in the conversation flow. So it is still linked to that document that's further up. And this is just a straight approval rejection. But I could say, actually, there's different uh, different ones here. So I could say approve or approve with edits or reject things like this. OK, uh, and I'm going to click send. Oh, yeah, I haven't used this before. So there you go, I need to, to approve it, but there you go. So now everybody who's in this team can see that that has been sent, which is just going through in the moment. Just give it a second. So now everybody can see that that's been sent. So I've sent that to Jack, but because, because I put Jack's name on it, I can't do anything with that. But everybody can see what the status is. So that really gives us really powerful visibility. If we think about how many times we send a document off to somebody to go and approve with it, and then you're going, well, have they have they replied yet? Oh, well, I don't know whether they've replied because it came by email and the email would have gone back to Jack, but Jack's on leave and things like this. So here everybody can see what's happened. It's really, really super transparent. And then if I change to my other persona. There I am there, and, and now I'm as Jack. So Jack has got that inline thing there, and it's saying he can approve it, he can reject it, or whatever. So I can approve that. Okay, and that will go through to everyone. It will send a message back to the requester. But again, everybody will be able to see in line in that chat what's happened to that document, that it has been approved. Now you might say, well, actually, I'm in loads of different teams and I'm all over the place and I've got approvals. I've got approvals everywhere. How do I know where all of those approvals are? And that's where the actual approvals app itself comes in, because if you pull this approvals app here up on the uh, left hand side. There we go there. We can see actually here's the one. So these are ones that I've received so I can see any that are outstanding. So I can see that this one here, this document is actually still that's still outstanding. And I can see there's the document. I can do whatever I need to do and I can approve that. So you've still got that central place where all of those happen. Um, and then similarly, you can actually just click on send and see what you've sent through. And then the last one is around forms. So again, really powerful here. We could collect customer feedback in forms. I'm not going to do a massive demo on this because I'm quite conscious of time. But you know, we can create forms in in our uh, lowest lowest kind of in the crawl process. Then we can keep it really really simple. Just a form. Here it is. Here. Okay, picking up some details. So let's say that this was our customer satisfaction form. Okay. And and there you go. So I've said it's a customer satisfaction form. Form knows actually here are the types of questions that people ask on customer satisfaction. So it's actually now trying to help you to do that. So, um, you know, how how responsive have we been to your questions and concerns? Um, how likely are you to recommend us? Please, you know, how would you rate value for money? Please share any additional comments. All of those things. And I can click add selected and they get all of those questions have come in there. OK, but again, if, if I have my own question, which I would say, um, you know, are you happy with the final product? 
again, it's come here and said, look, you've got these questions like, yes, no. So we can we can put those things in here. So we can say yes, we can know here, we can say no here, all of those things. So that's at the simplest level, we could do that and we could collect that. We would get all of our responses here. We get these super pretty, wonderful graphs, um, really, really great. But then what we can do is we could start to, to make it more advanced. We could be looking at advanced branching. So we could say, well, actually, if you said that this, you know, if we said that you said average, below average or poor, what we might want to do on this one is go off and add a branching question. OK, so if it says excellent, above average or average, we might say, well, actually, I'm going to go to question five. There we go, question five, question five, question five. But if we said below average or poor, then I'm going to want to go to four because I want to have that question in. OK, so there just by having a little bit. Of advanced uh, advanced branching, there we go. So we can say if I say above average, I've gone to question five, but in here it's visible as question four. If I say below average, I've got that additional thing. So again, it allows us just so we've got the value straight away from using forms, but by using that advanced branching, we've got a little bit more, um, a little bit more value from that. And then lastly, we've got automating actions. So here, all of these, all of these responses just live within forms, and we can pull them out. We can open up an Excel document and do whatever. But what you could do is you could say, actually, what we're going to go is we're going to go to flow. And I'm going to create my own again. It's the same as we had before. Create here. Oops, a new flow. I'm going to do an automated one. OK, and I'm going to call this unhappy customer. OK, and I'm going to say when a new form uh, response comes in. What I want to do. So where is it? Is my customer satisfaction form? What I want to do is I want to get the form response. When it comes here, I want to get those response details from the form, the one that's just come in. OK, and then what I want to do is say. That if are, are you happy with the product? Is no. OK, then I want to notify somebody. I need to notify the person who's responsible for that so that they get that straight away and they can jump on that and say, oh, I'm really sorry that you've said uh, that you're not happy. How can we make that better for you and really help us with that customer satisfaction? Now, none of those things are like massive, you know, massively high value solutions in their own right that would warrant somebody going off and making a business case, then getting some business analysts to go and look at things, then going off and hiring some developer who's going to do that. But imagine if you had 10,000 people and those 10,000 people we're all able to kind of save half an hour a week by using any of these things. That's a lot of time you're getting back within your organization. So, uh, so that is that. I can see there's lots of questions. Uh, da, 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 da. How can I can I create a clickable link to that post in the flow? I'm really sorry, Sophie. I've rattled on for so long. I don't know what the context of the thing was. So if you could perhaps just pop the context in the chat, then I will I will pick that bit. I'll pick that bit up there. Uh, interesting distinction between where are the approvals versus how can I make sure I don't miss an approval? It doesn't actually matter where the doc app list item is stored as long as you don't miss one. Absolutely. That's a great that's that's a great shout. And I'm going to use a Microsoft example here. So we have um, we have a, a, a system internally that gives us access to certain customer details and things like this. And every three months, because we're super responsible, you have to reattest to say, yes, I still need access to this, this data, etc. And it goes to your manager. Now, currently, it goes to my manager by email. If he misses that email, then on such and such a date, then it will expire. Then I have to go and badger him. Uh, and then I have to go and do it. And then I have to wait two days for that for him to click through for it to be uh, kind of automated and things like this. So that's a great process there to actually say, you know, let's stop that being an email approval. Let's bring that into the approvals. This is actually that's actually a, that comes later in the pro code there. 
Uh, Kerry, can you automate generating a single form response to PDF and saving it to Microsoft Teams? Absolutely, you can. So forms is super powerful. Uh, so when we go into here, there are great partners who build things in here. So some of them are, are premium ones where you might need to go and uh, pay for the partner to do it. But things like here, you might you can kind of uh, so Encodian allows you to do things here where you can convert PDFs, like convert like an HTML to a PDF, PDFs to words, convert the post to those kind of things, um, all of those kind of things. Um, and there are other ways that you can do. It. You can generate Word files as well. Um, and I believe, I believe there is a session on later. I think about some of the stuff of like that. I've got a slide right at the end, which is saying, oh. Here are some cool other sessions that you might be interested in. Uh, so please come back. When we automate the notification to Teams, that a, when we automate the notification to Teams, that a new item is creating a list. Can I? Oh yes. Can I go to item via the posted message in the channel? Absolutely, absolutely. Great, 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 great shout. Let's just go back to here. I think it was this one. Notify blocked. So yeah, great shout. So what we could do here is say this project item has been um, changed to blocked. And then I could say um, link to item. And then that will generate that link to an item. And actually, if I wrapped it up here with this link tag, then it would do that as well. So um, yes, absolutely, you can do that. If we've got the data, you can do it. It's all super duper clever. Super duper clever stuff. All right, OK, so now I want to move on, then look at low code. Um, so. I'm sure you've had lots and lots of stuff about low code. Everybody's talking about low code and no code, about the power platform, super powerful. But how do we get into it? How do we enable people to DIY? Because we say low code and no code, but for some people, even no code is just too much code for them. Too many buttons where they go, oh, this looks really scary for me, or uh, things like this. So actually, let's go back to our crawl, walk, run kind of template here. So crawl is to look at some of the templated apps, templated bots and templated flows. There are absolutely great ones that are in there and we build the ones that people commonly want. And that allows people to focus on configuration rather than writing their own. So one of the things here that I'm looking at are power apps in Teams. So if you're not familiar, if you're not familiar, let's go back to here. And we'll just switch context. So we'll say that we are on, do you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make my own team. I'm going to make a new team here. Let's just make one so we've got that. So I'm going to make a manufacturing team. Okay. And as part of that manufacturing team, I need to go and do audits or checks or inspections and things like this. And that would be a great use case. Uh, let's add in just a few people there and that would be a great use case for a power app and somebody goes oh well that's going to be that's going to be at least six months to build that three months to build that two months to build that, whatever okay but there are great apps that already are here that are built into power uh, into teams so if i go here to the little dot 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 fella here and go to power apps uh, I can see that we've got the what we call these hero apps, so employee ideas, so being able to gather ideas from employees. Oops, yep, let's skip that. Go away, that's it. So employee ideas, so gathering apps from employees. Really great app. I don't know if that looks a bit rubbish or not. There we go. Uh, but you can start up campaigns, people can do ideas, and people can vote them up and down. Really powerful app. But what if you were running a software product or a line of business app or something like this, and you actually wanted to have your kind of own internal user voice where you said, well, actually, I want people to be able to suggest new features and I need people to, to vote that up and I'm going to make that my, my feature backlog. So what you can do is use the ideas app as your feature backlog. So it doesn't have to be like an employee ideas app where you're saying we need more microwaves in the canteen because there's a big queue at lunchtime, things like this. Again, issue reporting. Issue reporting is a, a great app there. So we had SharePoint list as our example, but here issue reporting allows you to report things, categorize them uh, and things like this. And it's all of these apps, it's about configuration, not around actually build. 
bulletins allows you to create um, this company wide place for notifications. Got really nice, rich links to YouTube clips and video and, and all of those kind of things. And people can like posts and, uh, and get, so you get some metrics on what's on what's trending high and low. Um, and then milestones. Milestones is another kind of a bit like a project management project management light type app there. Um, how can we say what our, our milestones are around some deliverable um, and do that? But the one I'm going to talk about, and then there's new ones here. So, there's, so these ones are actually, if you click on these, this takes you off to a GitHub link and you've got to in, import them. But these will, these will come in and be just one click solutions like these. Um, so the one I wanted to do was actually do my inspection app. So I'm going to click inspection, add it to my team and Where's my manufacturing? There he is. My manufacturing team. Set a tab up. Just wait a minimo. There we go. So because this is the first time I've used a power app in this team, it has to it has to do a little bit more setup work here. Uh, so the context of this app that it gives us is actually around a retail scenario. Um, so all of the data that's in there already is around kind of like a shop inspection. But I talk to customers and they go, oh, we've got pool cars. So when somebody hires out a pool car or returns a pool car, I need to have something that kind of says an inspection and says, let's go through this and see and, and look at the damage, et cetera, that's on this. Because again, all of these power apps here, these hero apps in Teams, they're all app, they're all optimized for mobile. They're all accessible. Um, and all you have to do is just a little bit of um, a little bit of configuration. So this is just going to take a moment. And what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to install as well, just in this team, because I know that it needs it, a oops, a tasks board. There we go. And there we go. I'm going to create a new plan here, and I'm going to call this manufacturing tasks. There we go. Oh, look, and there we go. And whilst I was just doing that, I got a little pop up saying that my inspection app had come in as well. So if I go to the management app that sits here behind, so again, we're focusing here on configuration and not on not on code. So first time I need to just click allow. And this is just going to walk me through the setup of this. So it says you need a tasks tab so I can say, yes, I've got a task tab. And it's in here uh, and it's called manufacturing tasks and lives in this team. OK, it gives you a little a little uh, kind of possibility thing here. So it's saying actually you could use this app for store walk or asset inspection or area audit. All of those things and I can go, let's go. Yeah, and you can see here. So I've got my location. So in my supermarket context, it's ambient backstage front desk frozen. OK, but I could have a location here, which is going to be um, OK. Um, raw materials storage. Uh, and then what kind of location type is this? So this is going to be let's just go here and I'm going to add a location type, which is going to be a storage area. There we go. So. Da, 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 da. There and save that uh, and go back. So let's do that again. So raw materials storage, and that is going to be, oh, I didn't save it properly. Oops, that's going to be a new type. But you can see here that we could have picked a clothing one, etc., or a food one. So let's save that. OK, and then what we have here are our inspection forms. So we've got a uh, inspection form here and let's say that this was going to be the uh, materials storage audit. And I might say that that only applies to the food area and new type because I didn't put it in there properly. But I could say, OK, so the checklist steps are that we need to um, ensure all um, high item storage has warning signs. 
I don't know, I'm making this up now. I should have thought about this more. Well. I can add inspect uh, instructions on what that audit step looks like. And I could say it's either OK or it's got an issue or it's not uh, or it's not applicable. And then I could also include a photo to say this is what good looks like. OK, let's do another one here, which is going to be um, high value items are stored in a locked area. There we go. So I'll just save those two steps there. OK, I'm just going to go back here and just check. But OK, so I put it as food. That's all right, just for the moment. OK, but I've got um, I've got that audit there. So it's really, really, it's quite lightweight on the uh, on the configuration here. So then I can um, Oops, I clicked the wrong place. I can then go to the inspection app. So here I'm doing it on my on my laptop, but I could be doing it on my phone as well. So this is what the end user would see. And then here they can say, all right, OK, I'm going to perform an inspection. And I'm going to be doing the inspection in the raw storage area, and it's going to be the material storage audit. So here we can say ensure all high item storage has warning signs. So I can say, yes, that has. OK, that's fine. High value items are stored in a locked area. I oh, know there's an issue here. I'm going to add a photo. So let's pretend I'm on the phone. I would have taken a photo of that. Um, I can add a note here. So um, very valuable stuff out in the open. OK, I can save that note attached to that. But this is where it gets really great is I could also just do a task. So if I click on the task pane, I could assign that to someone. So let's kind of assign it to me as one of my other personas. And I can say very valuable stuff out in the open. Put it away. OK, and then I can add that task into there. OK, so I go and do my inspection. That's all done. I'm happy with that. I can click submit inspection. This will just take a mini moat. There it goes. OK, and then there's another app that's in there that's for reviewing that. So to say, well, actually, I'm giving you you're the person who needs to review the inspections. So you might have multiple sites and they might be doing this all over the place. And they can say we can say, ah, the raw materials storage one here. Oh, there's uh, an audit that came in this morning. I need to just check that. Ah, I can see here there's an issue to that. OK, so um, this is pending action now and I can go back and, and do that. So track those across there. Now, what happened to that task that you put in? I hear you ask. Uh, and there it is. So if I go to the manufacturing task board, here is that task. It's been automatically assigned to that person. They'll get a notification to do that. And that is actually all in the crawl stage. We haven't even gone on to walk or run. We've just gone into the crawl bit. Um, and then as we walk up, you know, we can start to customize those, build our own versions and then really coming up to use the run. You could really add the complexity in. Um, Kerry's asked a question. If you want to use the inspection app across multiple sites, could you include a site ID? Absolutely. You could. Um, so what you could do. So you've got a couple of options. So I'm really trying not to get you to change the code, because one of the default answers that people would say is to say, well, that's all right. You can, this is a power app. You can change it. You can include extra fields. So here we want to actually have, we want to be uh, looking at, at having, um, we want to be looking at configuration, not code. Okay. So what you could do is when you add your location, location there, you could say, you know, um, site for RT, oops for RT um, and you could actually just do those sites and then when they do all the locations, let's say that we had the backstage area or the clothing area or whatever. So you could say that that site for RT storage and then you get that overview. So just by adding in locations, you'd actually be able to have multiple sites um, across there. So that's that. Da, 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 da. I'm so far behind. There was so much to talk about. I'm so excited about that one. So then the last one is to talk about pro developers. So I'm not going to tell you about this kind of scary graph here, but I'm just going to point out these six what we call extensibility points. So let's say that you're a business owner and you've got a line of business app. So let's say it's a um, 
line of business app that does customer order fulfillment i don't know you know it's not it's not a dynamics thing it's not uh it's not anything like this it's just a custom app that you've built and it's sitting on its own it's not sitting in teams it's not integrated it's not helping us out here okay you can go and talk to your devs go and talk to your devs and you want to say to them i want you to be looking into microsoft teams extensibility and understanding how i can teamsify our really important line of business app and these are the six points that we could have here so you can create bots so you could get a bot that goes off and queries that customer fulfillment data that database so that line of business app you could put a bot front end to it for people so if they needed to check in say what's the status for order one two three four they could just type it in that and it could return them information in line in teams they don't have to go out so let's say your line of business app is optimized for desktops but actually we're finding there's a lot more people who are mobile out and about on a phone and they don't get access to the the big line of business app solution you could do a bot that would uh, that would help them to find that out tabs so you so really you know here where we've got uh you know where we've got teams that are all working together on a common purpose you can surface your app content as a tab within that so they don't have to go off and load it or go and browse through to the website or whatever for that they can load that into there and but then they get all of these benefits like having this conversation tab which is associated to that app as well and people can be out mentioned or all of those kind of things message extensions i showed you the approvals app message extension down the bottom there where you could click on that and then initiate a process that could be uh, that could be coming into here and searching work items that could be searching customers whatever so that could be that um, i'm looking i might have a, a message extension here and it pulls up all overdue orders and i could see one here that's been stuck for two days and i could click on it it could pull in the order details and i could tag raz and say at raz what's going on with this this order's blocked sort it out um, and and just give them a bit of a, a bit of a prod using teams but that message extension kind of goes and gets the data unfurls it and displays it in a really useful way so not saying to raz raz what's the, what's the deal with order 1743 and then he has to go off to the third part to our line of business app go and log in go and put 1743 in there find out what the details are come back have that conversation with me because we use that message extension it pulls through the nate the important data into that card and gives him the information to go oh i know about that one yep we're waiting for stock to come from the bristol branch or whatever okay um you can get your line of business app to actually post into the activity feed so up here at the top of teams where we've got this activity bell which currently for lots and lots of organizations is just things that says uh raz mentioned you in a post or prince replied to your thing or you know whatever he loved your post you can actually get your line of business app to write into that activity feed so it becomes really useful for your users, for your business users. Um, adaptive cards. So we mentioned there about when something happens, you can actually post adaptive cards in here that allow people to action things. So maybe that we have this item, this, this order that came in and it got stuck. It should have been automatically put into a fulfillment queue, but it hasn't. I could send that card, it could, or the system could send that card to Raz to say, this has been stuck for two days you need to reroute it to another fulfillment center and he could just pick the fulfillment center from that drop down list click save he would go and do whatever it needs to do but he's he's in the flow he hasn't had to go after the system to go and uh, log in go to that line of business app etc really becoming really useful and then personal apps here on this left hand side um, allows you to see that overview a bit like we were talking there about approvals but the same you get up with tasks and planner and things like this so those are the three kind of columns there about it so the question is how do we get there i'm really going through this really quickly i know raz is like he hasn't made any time for questions i'm, I'm so annoyed but i'm, I'm going to get that i will i will raz i promise so when i talk about how we get that i think about how we learn how children learn and all these kind of things um so as an organization we need to give people permission to play we need to make space within their day, within their capacity to say, we're encouraging you to do things differently. And, and you know, we'll give you the knowledge, but we want you to experiment. You're not going to break it. It's fine. And that links into the next one, which is permission to fail. 
If you try something and it doesn't work, we've learnt. We can refine that, whatever. But again, permission to play and permission to fail are key to uh, innovation within an organisation. Then, whoop, whoop, permission to, to celebrate, not permission to celebrate, we need to celebrate success. So when somebody does innovate, now, however small that is, we need to celebrate those innovations because it might be that uh, Doris in finance has made this list and it's saving finance two hours a week. But the person in the next department goes, oh, well, I think we could do something similar. And that'll probably save us 20 hours this week. So celebrate people because that will also inspire the finance team to go on and say, oh, I've got something else I want to do that's cool as well, etc. And then adopt. I think one of the things that we can do as leaders within our organisation is help people to understand adoption, because I'm sure that you'd all be super aware of lots and lots of IT projects that get chucked over the fence uh, and then people don't use. So we really need to lean in and support people. So if somebody's got that approval, so the approval is a prime example. A prime example there is somebody needs to kind of add the authority to say, yes, we are accepting that approval as the approval because I'm sure we've all been there where you've sent an approval and somebody's taken a screen snip of, a, of an approval, then they've gone and stored it in a file store somewhere and things like this. So really helping them to adopt that by saying, yes, that, that thing that you've done is good enough. That is fine for us. And those are my four things on how we can encourage an adoption culture. So just as I go through, there's just a few sessions you might be really interested in that I've picked up. So today we've got um, taking Microsoft Teams to the next level, which is really interesting. Microsoft Teams and Dataverse power up your apps. Um, be something that would be really useful to you looking at that power app journey. And then stop the emails already. Alternative solutions to email notifications. That is my big bugbear. And then uh, tomorrow, Power Platform and Microsoft Teams better together really looks interesting to me. An overview, so this is ProDev, overview of Microsoft Teams and Graph API. Uh, Reza looking at SharePoint list formatting basics. Great one, that one. Um, and then last one here from Deepak on Microsoft Planner Automation with Power Automate. You can do so much on that. Um, so those are, those are my killer sessions to go for. Um, so there you go, that's all the socials. Uh, Reza, I'm giving you three minutes for questions. I did answer questions through that during on the chat, so I'll, I'll allow myself off. Thank you, Thank Stuart. You. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent, Excellent. Great. great. So there is one question um, by yeah, Kerry, Kerry Baker. Baker. Yeah. Uh, Kerry's asking, Kerry's if you wanted to use the inspection app across multiple sites, could you include a site ID? Oh, you've answered it already. I you? answered that one already. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Well, look, there's lots of great feedback here. Um, again, big thanks to Stuart. You covered a lot of ground today. A great zero to hero kind of session to get people confident in, use, in using Teams to start driving the collaboration. So again, big, big thank you to Stuart. Stuart, um, so you've got your, um, obviously your Twitter link, your LinkedIn, and then your YouTube. I've shared your YouTube. You've got lots of great content on your YouTube. So make sure you follow that YouTube channel. Make sure you follow Stuart on LinkedIn. You're always publishing content on a regular basis, aren't you, Stuart? I am. I am. Lots and lots, lots and lots of uh, customers then share that internally as part of their adoption efforts and things like this. Um, so, yes, please, please go and, uh, and go and look on that. So, yeah, thank you very much for having me today. Though. I've loved it. Thank you, Stuart. We hope to see you soon in person. Um, oh, early me next too. Year. Me too. I really I'm, I'm itching. I'm itching for in-person conferences. Fantastic, Stuart. So once again, that was Stuart Ryder. Make sure you follow him on Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube. I'll be sharing the, the links. If not, if you can share the links, do it in the chat uh, to make it easy for people to connect with you. Um, that'd be really helpful. Um, so there you have it. That was Stuart. Um, so that was a Stuart Rideout experience. Make sure you follow him on YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter uh, to keep up to date with all this cool update information and these tips that are going to really help your organizations keep up to pace and improve their collaboration efforts. So once again, big, big, huge thanks to Stuart. Thank you. Hope to see you soon. Thanks, Fantastic. That was Stuart. Okay. Um, so now moving on.